Well, good morning. So it's uh, obviously you're struggling to see me because it's it's only six o'clock as well. Should be much brighter than this, but it ain't. And it is day one, St Oswald's Way, and as you can tell, grey misty morning drizzling with a bit of rain and that seems to be the weather forecast for the entire week which again classic british weather we've had nothing but scorching sunshine and then you go away for a week and you get rain so here we are at our digs for three days slept all right last night got kind of a subdued evening but quite eager to get started, get a few miles under the belt. And we are literally out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what was going on last night, but on one of the roads or paths just outside the window, I could see people walking with head torches, maybe people off the beaten track. Yeah, that's all I've got to report. So, waiting for the rest of the guys to get up. Bring you back at the start of the trail, or at least in the van on the way to the trail. It's about an hour's drive from here to the start, but that's just for day one. Obviously we've got a lot of miles to cover, uh, and at the end of that trail that'll put us much nearer to this place, so there won't be as much travelling tomorrow. So, Yeah, six o'clock and already quite dark. Right, right, see you in a bit. So on this trip we decided rather than use two cars to shuttle, uh, Bill who's Tim and Patrick's dad would join us and he would do the majority of the driving to and from starts and end points of the trail itself. St Oswald's Way is a long distance walking route and it's based entirely in Northumberland. It follows the places associated with St Oswald, who was king of Northumbria early in the 7th century, and he played a major part in bringing Christianity to these people. For purposes of this trip, the north route normally stretches from Holy Island all the way south along the Northumberland coastline to Heavenfield, which is on Hadrian's Wall. But for this, we reversed the route, and we're going to be very glad that we did by the end of these videos. You'll see that we start in Heavenfield, which is on Hadrian's Wall, of which you're watching now as we make our way east. And it will carry on north along the coastline, all the way up, eventually ending at Holy Island or Lindisfarne. On the way are coasts, islands, scenic river valleys, hills, villages, forests and farmlands. And we see not too many abandoned buildings, abandoned farms and even abandoned tractors. Holton Shields and this would mark the start of the turn onto St Oswald's Way and breaking away from Hadrian's Wall. It was nostalgic to visit the wall again, possibly for the fifth time, 
Um, but we were glad now to be making our way north, actually on the trail, following the bird marker that you saw, marking St. Oswald's Way all the way up to Holy Island. At this point we stopped for a break and uh, Tim presented us with biltong and I can't stand biltong or beef jerky. Uh, it has a texture of old leather which is pretty much what it is. Instead I opted for my uh, sandwich, much tastier. Oh, horse box. Oh dear. Oh, okay. I don't think it was meant to, oh, meant dear, to do that. Worse. <laughs> okay, last one in puts the bolt back. <laughs> we put a stick in there to try and hold it in. Perfect engineering. This is the right way. Yes. We made our way up onto high elevation to give us some great views of the Northumberland countryside. And you'll see early on that for stage one and would subsequently be stage two and three farmers fields often filled with sheep and bulls are the main company you'll get on this trail we don't actually see the coastline until much later so from here it's Howington and on to Little Barrington
we are currently facing a cow invasion. With cows on the left, cows on the right. Oh, they've given up. They have the high ground on our, on our eastern flank. These, on the other hand, have given up. Notice they charge down the hill to attack, but then return to the hill to regroup. A couple of constants on this trail. Firstly, farmers like to divert it around their farmland and we did encounter one farmer who was quite miffed to have to put up signage for the uh, St Oswald's Way. And the second is that most of the wildlife you'll see in these fields are bulls and they really don't like hikers. the great joys of St Oswald's Way is being able to visit some of these historical church buildings. A lot of them are active and they do encourage you to go in and make use of the facilities. This one allowed you to use the kitchen, the toilets and to perhaps sit in the pew and meditate on the trail so far. We did make use of all of them and if you're ever on the trail be sure to go to the visitors book and see our entry in September 2022. stage came to an end and we made the final ascent up to Kirk Welpington. We were feeling quite tired. The trail had proven to be difficult, passing through farmers fields proved tiresome and the scenery hadn't been overly exciting. But still excited for the rest of the trail we made our way into the small village where we'd meet Bill and before seeing the church famous in Kirk Welpington we were quite glad to see Bill already parked up in his van, table, chairs and a brew already on the go. The guy was an absolute legend.
these two started with a promising looking sky and an even more promising weather report. But at the first field we realised we had to divert onto the main road to get around a very big field of bulls. As soon as we climbed up on top we started getting the stunning views of the Northumberland countryside again. Already the sky was clearing and it was starting to warm up pretty quick. towards Harwood Forest, the beauty of the Northumberland countryside really started to open up. But we soon realised that we'd have to take a large diversion on the trail all the way around this farmland in order to get to Harwood Forest. Had I been planning the route, I would have cut straight across and chopped maybe a mile and a half off. And of course we had an obligatory field of cows to negotiate. Now this detour we go down in history as one of the biggest detours I've ever had to make off trail. This turned out to be about a mile and a half long and took us way up onto higher elevation within Harwood Forest itself. Now as I'm filming this video this is September 2022 and if you're attempting the trail after this then I assume that perhaps that diversion may have been cleared. It's the result of the storm damage done by Storm Arwen. Uh, causing many blowdowns and something we'd see all over the trail in the days to come. So it was a legitimate diversion, but I hope in the years to come they'll clear it. So we should be going down there. Now we diverted down there. It doesn't really come across on the video but that track is really stony and after a while it really did start to wear on our boots and on our feet. Not to mention, though it looks cloudy now, the sun and the heat was blazing. We soon switched to boonie hats and a one and a half mile to two mile detour turned into a gruelling death march. find yourself walking St Oswald's Way in the future. This finger post is almost completely obscured from the road that you're on. Coming out of Harwood Forest just before Coquette Cairn, this track is almost impossible to see. As you can see from the forestry damage, the trail is almost completely obscured now and it took about a mile to cross this entire area, very uneven, very difficult terrain. This second finger post again was obscured and you can see me talking to the camera here very frustrated and very angry that the trail has been almost destroyed.
came down that slope and most people take the bridge that way and come up this way but the path actually goes that way nobody uses it anymore Well, where was the Dwegger? The Dwegger? He's a will o' the wisp called the Dwegger. He entices and snares unwary travellers. It's hard to put into words just how good it was to see a sign for Rothbury. We knew that was going to be the end of the trail for that day. And as we came up through the moorland, we were exhausted and ready to stop walking for that day. Still, we were given these stunning views, not only of Northumberland, but of Rossbury itself, which sits on the sort of valley side next to the River Coquette. So we made our way down amongst beautiful green foliage, still spotted with heather, making our way towards Sharp's Tower. Well, Tuesday morning, St Oswald's stage three. Just heading to the end point to drop my car off because we're changing accommodation today. Uh, then we're gonna do a 16 miler from Rothbury, uh, heading towards the coast and then go to our new digs. So uh, yeah, a bit of driving and then we'll get on the trail. So we put Rothbury behind us under a grey sky, it was still warm and muggy and there was a promise of sunshine later on but we definitely knew the rain would come later. So we hoped to put these fields behind us and continue on towards the coast. Even though the terrain was 
wet and muddy and we still enjoyed coming across these old railway lines that must have run the, from the quarry into town. Some of the stonework and the features here were just fascinating and it was great to be able to walk through them. This was an ancient farmhouse and it was such a fascinating find and if you walk in St Oswald's Way I do recommend you give a few minutes just to explore it. There was plenty of debris from all ages from points when the farm was at its youngest and then on from there to more recent occupation. A lot of the roof beams were dangerously uh, covered with fallen trees and actual new trees had had time to grow up through each of the rooms as you can see here. There was an ancient stove made into the brickwork and I wouldn't like to date anything because that's just not my forte but we were absolutely fascinated by the history here and even towards a tractor that had just been left to rot outside with weeds growing up amongst it. Absolutely fascinating and well worth stepping off the trail just to check it out.
Eventually we tore ourselves away from that farmhouse and continued on the trail, navigating some tricky turns and bends around a holiday home. And here we're descending into a small valley before coming up the other side, where we'd pick up the River Coquette, which would be our guide for the rest of the day as we made our way east towards the coast. destined to face every kind of weather today perhaps not snow but at this point the sun was thoroughly beaming down on us and we started to sweat we started with gray overcast morning and now here we were in the full glory of an afternoon sun which was ironic given what we knew was around the corner stopped for lunch in a small plantation and that's when the thick grey clouds made a return. The first spatterings of rain were about to come in and what would no doubt be a complete deluge was well on the cards.
With a final one mile push left, we headed down Rake Lane towards Morwick and to Morwick Ice Cream Parlour. Well, I can tell you now, at this point, we did not feel like ice cream. So with our heads bent and all as much waterproofing on as we could manage, we uh, pushed on down Rake Lane, just longing to reach the car. Just to assure you, I parked my car in a perfectly legal place. I'm not sure why this note was left for me, but I did find it quite amusing. Well, with that rainy day put behind us, we look forward to finally hitting the coast and maybe even getting some nice sunshine and even a cream tea. That's what we were hoping for as we set out on stage four and already with the dawn coming, we were amazed at the sights. Finally got to see our first view of the sea as we left Walkworth and headed onto one of many golf courses that litter St Oswald's Way. We followed the path through the dunes which were well signposted but we did have to watch out for the occasional flying golf ball. After a few hours of walking we realised we weren't going to get anywhere decent to stop for a break and a brew so we pressed on looking at the map seeing that Arnmouth which was maybe a two miles down the way might offer us a decent cafe and that elusive cream tea and it had been a while since I'd enjoyed one on the trail and we were quite looking forward to it. there it was the wait was over the cream teas were had but we did get a running commentary from the locals about how to apply the cream and the jam and it appears I committed a social faux pas thoroughly refreshed we headed up onto the dunes and the cliffs and from here the views of the ocean were stunning. The sun was out, the breeze was gentle and cool, and we just spent most of our time snapping pictures and recording video, most of which I've actually edited out of this video, otherwise you'd have to face one hour of ocean views. 
The views themselves were stunning. The smells, the sights, the sounds of a coastal town, amazing. And this pillbox or fortress offered us a little bit of amusement as we explored. say that for me this stage of the entire trip was possibly the best we had the best weather the best conditions the best footpath and just the best views gazing out onto the vastness of the ocean seeing those breakers crashing into the cliffs just the entire feel and walk of the trail was just amazing and it will go down in my memory as the best part of St Oswald's Way matched only by the final day on the Holy Island. We arrived in the busy seaside town of Craster with plenty of time to spare and with the sun hot on our backs. We made our way to the car park to meet Bill, who of course was waiting with the kettle boiled and the chairs already out. Another stage done. stage five today, Craster to Bamba and uh, we're just driving to drop the car off at Bamba Castle. Rest the day yesterday so I didn't do any filming, just relaxed, recovered, feet feel a lot better. Yeah, it's going to be a wet one today. Ditched most of my kit, gone in favour of just a light pack and my rain gear so all mostly footpath. Uh, shouldn't be an issue today. Yeah, here's what it is. The Queen died yesterday. Grim. So, right, let's get to the trail and let's get started. Yeah. 
In an expected turn of events, the weather was the complete polar opposite of the previous day. It was horribly grey, thick scuddy cloud and it had already begun to rain. Like I said, it wasn't unexpected. We checked the weather and we'd uh, adjusted our kit accordingly. But there was no escaping the lack of morale and the mood which had dropped the minute we stepped out of the van. Dunstanborough Castle loomed ahead. With the grey cloud, the wet weather and the choppy seas, the atmosphere was medieval. It was movie-esque, but it didn't do anything to lift our spirits. The path itself was easy to walk, though it was pockmarked with large puddles and stony paths. But, compared to the fields earlier, it was a blessing. Either way, we weren't hanging around and we were pressing on. It was at this exact point when I hit my lowest ebb. There were a few things that had gathered over the previous few days and to finally come from the heights of that sunny, beautiful coastline to this dreary, grey environment really knocked my morale. I was at my lowest point and I really did, as I was walking along, consider going home. Calling a taxi, persuading the guys that it was game over and going home. At this point, if we were to not do the mileage for the day, the trip would basically be over. There would be no point carrying on because none of us had the time off work to make up the lost mileage. It was either press on or give up. By this point, we'd walked almost half the mileage without stopping. It was time to re-energise with some cake, with some breakfast, give our heads a little wobble and crack on with the day. The rain is so wet. <laughs> it's very wet rain. It's the kind that gets you wet. As you can tell, spirits had lifted, but our sanity was quickly vanishing. We pressed on, and from sea houses, a local fishing village, all the way to Bamba Castle, we saw that most of the people on St Oswald's Way were bypassing the Dune Walk and its official footpath in favour of the paved road. I don't think we lost anything by doing that, but it's up to you if you're a hardcore walker of the trail, you might want to stick to the true path. But in that weather, there was no chance. We 
walk on the penultimate day of St. Oswald's Way to grey skies, but reasonably dry weather. The final day was looming, but we had one more trip to make, a 15 mile inland trail heading to Belford and on to Fenwick. We passed through yet another golf course and through a final plantation where we hoped we wouldn't be diverted for another two miles. By now I was quite keen to be on my way home. Although we had a final day of inland walking, which I thought was quite disappointing. We'd had so much nice coastland and to turn inland to avoid some farmer's fields seemed a bit of a disappointment. Still, it was going to be 15 miles of trail done and we only had seven to do the following day. It seemed a shame that by now we'd settled into a solid walking routine and we'd managed at least half the mileage again to reach Belford where we would stop, have breakfast for about an hour before pressing on with very few stops before the end or maybe just perhaps one more brew just for old time's sake.
after a short phone call to warn Bill that we were ahead of schedule, we finished our walk through the plantation. Devastation again caused by Storm Arwen, but thankfully this time not causing us any kind of diversion. The trail itself was pretty faithful, and these orange blazes marked places where the trees had really come down across the path. But by the end of it, we were glad to see the van waiting for us again. The final day had arrived. St Oswald's Way was coming to an end. A short trip from Fenwick to Holy Island, just seven miles, was ahead of us. Already the sun was shining and we had a promise from the weather forecast of a beautiful day. Through fields leading us towards the causeway, we passed abandoned buildings and even a box of apples free to a good home. The weather was stunning. It was a perfect way to end the trip and spirits were high as we all thought about sleeping in our own beds that night. As if the trail was bidding us one farewell, it gave us a final diversion. Around the railway line, past a crossing that had been vandalised in the past. It looks like this will be a permanent fixture to the St Oswald's Way, so expect to add an extra mile and a half onto your trip. Still unperturbed, we headed down to the coastal defences dating back to World War II, before finally reaching the causeway. perfect end to St Oswald's Way lay before us. The final few miles were done on the causeway itself, a stretch of tarmac road leading straight into Holy Island. We made the way laughing and joking. The weather was perfect. We couldn't have asked for a better way to bring the trip to a close and we knew that in a short while we'd meet up with Bill to walk the final mile with him to the Priory. St Oswald's Way officially ends at the Priory Ruins and as we approached it was with a lump in my throat that Bill gave us one final prayer. He prayed at every stage of the journey and he saw us off with one last prayer to our Lord to wish us a safe journey all the way home. They were to take the van and I, as I made my way back alone with just my pack, headed towards the car park for my nearly 200 mile journey back. As I got in my car, slightly saddened for it all to be over, but excited also to be on my way home, I was reminded of a quote from Tolkien. Roads go ever, ever on, under cloud and under star, yet feet that wandering have gone, turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in the halls of stone, look at last on meadows green, and trees and hills they long have known.